But with that, I will turn it over to Philip. Philip Hensley, take it away. Alrighty, thank you, Miss Brooklyn. Uh, as Brooklyn mentioned, I am. Uh, we are county neighbors here uh, in Cooperative Extension. Um, I'm over here in Spalding, uh, located in Griffin. I'm not actually on the experiment station on the Griffin campus, but uh, but I'm over. Uh, I share parking lot space uh, with the senior center uh, over here, which is currently our still our I guess our FEMA uh, headquarters for the moment here in Griffin. Uh, but if folks are familiar with their with with where that's at. Um, I always kind of like to throw the caveat out there if if there's kind of like she mentioned, people come across new and and interesting things while they're out gardening all the time. So uh, if anybody's ever stumped with something like that, feel free to to bring it to me. And and uh, I love those little kind of side projects. Um, I'm I'm a a bug nerd at heart. Uh, studied entomology um, for many years uh, at the University of Tennessee. Um, and uh, got my master's degree from up there and everything. And so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big big bug nerd uh, to say the least. So I was the one that warned Brooklyn from the beginning of, I'm gonna do my best to keep this under an hour um, just because I know every, everybody's got different commitments and, and things like that. But uh, uh, this, is, this is a, to say the least, insect knowledge is a passion of mine. So um, I could easily ramble on about it for a long time. So I'm gonna do my best with that. But yeah, at the end, I'll be happy to take any, any kind of questions you guys have. Um, I'm sure you guys have got some some fascinating stuff. And if there's something that we go over that just blows your mind and you need me to say it again or need to question something, feel free to do that. Uh, you won't hurt my feelings. We'll be I'll be happy to pull stuff back up and we can revisit something. But um, with that, let me pull up uh, my presentation here. Hopefully it will pop up for everybody. All righty. And let me move my face out of my own way here. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, well, forgive the punny title. Uh, I, I actually, this was uh, something my, I had a college professor that used to say all the time. He was a big Clint Eastwood fan, and uh, I just thought it was hilarious. He had a talk that he called the good, the bad, and the bugly, um, and so I kind of stole his little tagline there, but um, I've, I've got two teenagers and they talk in memes and puns all the time. So, uh, my, you know, this, this fits, uh, fits my daily conversations with them. So, um, but why, why are we here? What are we, what are we, or at least well, I assume why you'd be here is, is to help identify maybe what we're seeing in a garden situation. Again, whether it's a flower bed or a vegetable garden, um, we want to be able to tell, uh, or I guess I get a lot of questions really on, you know, was this a good thing or a bad thing? Um, was this a good a good bug I saw or a bad bug I saw? Um, and so the the goal of today is really to kind of go over um, probably some of the more common things you might be seeing. Um, some of the stuff you've probably heard of and maybe aware of, maybe you don't know how to prevent it or treat it if you see it, but maybe you've heard of the bug or maybe you've had it every every season, something like that. Um, but I always try to tell folks too that uh, whether or not something is a pest or or good or bad, uh, can change depending on where it is, right? So I always make the joke of if I see uh, if I see a ladybug uh, outside, no big deal. But if I see it, you know, or, or see a hundred of them in my living room, um, now it's something I got to deal with. Um, so it can completely be situational, just in the environment that you find yourself in. Um, you know, if I see a cockroach running around on the sidewalk outside, you know, outside a public school or something, no big deal. But if it's running across my pillow. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably have to do something about that. My wife won't, won't let that stand. So um, again, it's all situational on what is a pest and whether it can be good or bad. But um, but in general, as far as when we're talking about gardening, um, there are some pretty cut and dry definitions on on what's acceptable and, and what's not, what we want to be wary of and what's not. So I've got some images here, just, you know, just familiarize folks with um, that. Obviously, insects will come in all kinds of different shapes, sizes and colors. Um, even like the example of the ladybugs up there in the top left, I mean, those, they're both ladybugs. They're essentially identical, but they are two different species because they're different colors and different patterns. Um, you know, there's, I've got an aphid that's on the top right there. They're itty bitty, you know, usually out of sight. Most people don't think about them um, until they've got a problem on a plant and then they find out it's covered in aphids. But um, there are, I want to say it was near 5,000 different species of aphids in the world. So they're not all created equal. They all feed on different uh, host plants and things like that. So um, just because you know you may have 
aphids. It's it may not there there are treatments that are specific to some species of insects and treatments that are that that may not work for other species, just depending on again your your situation and your environment and what you're growing. So this was one of the questions I always posed, uh, uh, kind of if folks could discern which one of these bugs um, they would see in the garden. You probably would see both of them at some time, but how do I know if this is good or bad? Um, how do I know which one of the, I mean, to the average person, they may look pretty identical. They might be a little bit different color. I think the one on the left is going to be a little more orangey uh, color with some black markings. And the one on the right, that's a leaf-footed bug. Um, so several of you folks may have run into those. They, they can be found on all kinds of vegetable crops for sure. Um, they tend to show up about the time we think we've got every other pest in hand. And then now the leaf-footed bugs show up and, and change the whole game for us. So, uh, but the one on the left is a predatory. Uh, it's actually, it's a uh, assassin bug, a uh, species of assassin bug. And again, the one on the right is, is our pest. That's the leaf-footed bug. Um, so just being able to kind of note some differences between them, you know, the one on the left's got the, some adaptations that to me, if I'd just seen these, not knowing what their common names were, even as an entomologist, I can kind of look at some of the body attributes and say, huh, that one, the one on the left's built a little bit more like a predator, um, just from knowing some of the body features. And we'll, we'll go over that a little bit later. Uh, of what I'm looking at. This one's always a fun one. Uh, I get folks that say, this is a trick question, right? There's no way. Um, both of these are bad. I kill them all. They look identical. Well, actually, the one on the left this time, that's the brown marmorated stink bug, bug brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, this is the one that invades your homes uh, when you get stink bugs inside. Uh, this is an invasive species. Um, and then the one on the right is a native species. It is actually a predatory stink bug. And this is probably one of the harder examples to discern between, to look at and, and determine. Um, just from experience, I know that the brown marmorated stink bug has, has more white markings on it uh, than the native on the right. Uh, the antenna on the, the brown marmorated stink bug on the left, it's got two little white stripes on the antenna, and then it has these little white kind of triangle shapes around its abdomen, around the rear end of it there. Um, so I, I know that that one uh, is an invasive. Uh, is the invasive uh, brown marmorini stink bug. The one on the right, its common name is a two-spined shoulder bug. Um, it has literally has two little spines, look like little thorns on its shoulders. So if I see that and I'm not sure if it's a beneficial insect or if it's a bad insect, one I want to control, um, if I see those little spines on the shoulder blades like that, I know just from that species, I know that that is the native predatory stink bug. So I want to leave him alone. He's on the hunt for something. And he could eat anything from other stink bug nymphs to caterpillars, aphids, just about anything. Um, they both have the same kind of feeding. They have little straws or rostrums, basically, um, that are specialized for sucking. Uh, the For the pest, it would be to suck plant juices. It would stab it in, pierce it like a needle. Uh, and suck out all the chlorophyll and all the, the nutrients and water and things out of the plant tissue. But for the bug on the right, the predatory one, he's stabbing the pest uh, and doing the same action. Um, so a little more a little more gruesome, I guess, in that sense, that description, than thinking of a plant leaf. Um, but again, just an example of how hard it could be to kind of tell good from bad sometimes. But usually even before we see a pest, before we can identify what the pest is, what we usually see is damage, right? That's That gives us our first clue on what might be going on, whether it's um, these little weird leafy patterns down in the bottom left, um, all the little zigzag crazy patterns going on, or maybe we see like some of the other examples on here, some chewing damage where there's big holes in the leaves. Maybe we see some these little spots uh, that are all over our tomatoes or apples, things like that. Um, all of these different types of damage um, give myself, um, you know, whether it be county agents or or even you know, an entomologist like myself can look at this and say, okay, well, I know based on this kind of damage, what kind of pest we might be looking for. Uh, I may not know if it's a caterpillar versus a beetle versus you know, something else like that, but if it's, if it's got holes in the leaf, that's usually caused by chewing damage. So I know I'm not looking for a stink bug. Uh, I'm, it's probably gonna be a caterpillar pest or beetles also are chewing pests. So that kind of narrows it down to what, what I might find. Um, and then that's where, I can step in with a with a gardener or whatnot that's got pictures of an issue or something like that. I may be able to, depending on the plant, even uh, if it's a kale plant versus um, you know a tomato plant, you know versus cantaloupes or something like that. 
there are specific pests that will feed on those as well. So we just kind of, we really just kind of eliminate and kind of narrow the choices down based off uh, the damage we see, the type of plant that, that you're growing, um, and really even maybe even in the environment and time of year and things like that. There are plenty of pests that don't exist in the springtime that will come out in the fall or in the heat of summer and vice versa. So just knowing all those little parameters give us clues to what we're gonna narrow down the pest to be. Um, but a lot of times, uh, as I'm showing in this slide here, you can simply flip over a leaf a lot of times and find whatever is causing your problem. Maybe not necessarily with some of the chewing pests when you see a lot of holes or chewing damage where it looks like the leaf is torn or whatnot. But if you have some yellowing maybe on the leaves um, or maybe it looks like the leaves are kind of bleaching, maybe it, it, you know, almost like they're translucent that you can see through them, something like that. If you flip over those leaves, you may find hopefully not as big of a population as what we're seeing in some of these pictures, but a lot of times those pests are nearby. Um, now, the other issue is with a, like a caterpillar pest, uh, it may be that the caterpillar has now become a moth, and so maybe it's fluttering around, but maybe we see those moths flying around our garden, and maybe we don't think anything about it because a moth or a caterpillar isn't going to be our damaging pest. They're not causing the holes or the chewing damage that we may see on our fruits or leaves, but they're laying eggs. That's what they're. That's why they're buzzing around and flittering around uh, our cabbage and and tomatoes and things like that. They are actively laying eggs uh, each time they swoop down in there. Um, so another kind of thing I tell folks too a lot is if you see like the bottom left picture's got some eggs. Uh, those are little white egg clusters on there, um, probably from a stink bug would be my guess, just guessing the, their size and kind of their arrangement. Um, but usually if you see clusters of things, so like the image on the top left, we've got squash bugs on a squash plant. Um, that's a pretty large infestation there. Um, but if we see insects in a number like that, and maybe we don't know, maybe you don't know that that's a bad bug. Maybe you look at that and be like, oh, wow, look at all this. Uh, Insects in high numbers like that, when they cluster together, those are almost always going to be pests. That's usually a, a giveaway in a lot of situations, especially in a, in a vegetable garden situation. If they're predators, they're going to eat each other even. Um, yeah, I, I always use the example of like praying mantises, uh, even lady, ladybugs and ladybug larvae, things like that. They will prey on each other um, and have to defend themselves from each other. So they tend to disperse pretty quickly after they hatch, after they're born. Uh, they tend to spread out and look for prey. But if you've got these huge conglomerates, all shapes and sizes, and the bigger on these squash bugs, the bigger bugs are older. If you want to think of it that way, they're getting closer to molting into a full-fledged adult that will reproduce and lay eggs and things. And, but you've also got these itty-bitty little ones on there, too. So the, the younger, uh, more newly hatched ones as well. You see that scenario um, we have got all these different sizes. Those are almost always going to be pest insects. Um, they don't tend to, they congregate in numbers, kind of a, a, a just as, you know, safety in numbers kind of a, a tactic there, um, that there's so many that all the predators couldn't possibly eat them all kind of thing. And so that's how they persist. But so just a little tip there, if you see a huge mass of insects, it's probably a, pre, or probably uh, a pest. And then if you see one or two kind of in proximity to each other, more than likely that's going to be a, a predator. Not always, but, but generally is the case. So I just wanted to touch on a little bit of some uh, insect terminology and, and morphology here. I told Brooklyn uh, yesterday I, I could just about do an entire uh, presentation on just insect mouths. I'm sure you guys would be riveted by that. And if anybody ever wants to come by and talk about insect mouth parts, I'd, I'd love to chat with you about it. Uh, but there are so many shapes and sizes and variations. But the, the point of this is to really help um, explain you know how I could be able to look at damage on a plant and tell what kind of insect might have done that damage. Um, so again you got chewing mouth parts, the siphoning mouth parts which are your butterflies and things like that you know not going to cause any damage from that. Um, the piercing sucking I, I've got the example of a mosquito on here um, which is also a garden pest but uh, <laughs> just a life pest in general huh but uh, but your stink bugs and things like that will have those mouth parts, um, fleas, um, you know, anything like that that's got that, that piercing action. Sponging is more of a fly mouth part. That's not a damaging mouth part. Uh, but the rasping and sucking, those are thrips. Uh, I don't think I've got a slide on thrips on here today just for the sake of time. But um, that is a common, there are predator and pest examples of thrip insects. They're very, very tiny. They essentially have 
fine hairs for wings. They're so small. Um, they don't even really fly. They just kind of spread the little hairy wings out and just kind of blow on the breeze, just to give you an idea of how, how itty bitty those guys are. Um, but, but they have those features too and can damage plants with those mouth parts. So just, just kind of a brief overview of that. Another sign that I would look for um, if I wanted to, to see if I'm dealing with a, a good or bad pest, uh, we've got several different examples of, of egg masses here. All these egg masses that are on here are examples of pests that I would probably see um, in the garden. The one on the top left is going to be uh, the leaf-footed bug. A very unique way that it arranges its eggs um, on a straight line. Doesn't have to follow the vein of a leaf, um, but it's almost always going to be in a straight line like that. Um, there might be one or two that's that's out of whack, something like that. Maybe the breeze blew and they they put one out of out of, out of center, but. Um, for the most part, you may even have multiple lines of those. But if I saw that, I know immediately that that, that is the leaf-footed bug egg uh, on that. So, which is something I would look for, especially if I, if I saw an adult insect, I'm looking around for the eggs because that's that's going to be its main thing. Again, another, it's not as tried and true uh, as when you see a physical insect on the leaf. But if you see egg masses that are clumped like that, kind of clustered together, a lot of times, um, that can be an indicator that it's a pest, but not always. Um, praying mantises lay eggs in, in the hundreds um, all together like that. And those are not damaging insects in the sense of being a garden pest. Um, they're obviously a predator. So that's that's just one example. It's, you know, it's not a, not a true, true kind of uh, point blank way to discern, oh, look, I found these things. They look like eggs. There's 50 of them together. They must be bad. That's not always the case. Um, it's always better when you see the physical insect to kind of tell that. But but just getting pictures, if you guys saw something like this and sent sent myself or Brooklyn an image and said, hey, here's some, here's these weird things I found on the leaf. I don't know if they're bug eggs or or whatever the case. Um, that's a great tech uh, technique or way to discern what kind of pest we're dealing with uh, is is the shape and color and the arrangement of them, um, things like that. A lot of butterflies and things like that will lay one egg at a time as opposed to laying clusters. So um, if I find one little egg that's shaped like a, how usually how butterfly eggs or moth eggs are shaped, I can usually discern if that's a pest or not. A lot of times it comes in on the plant that it's on. Most insects will lay eggs on host plants. Um, they, they try not to make it too hard for their, their young to find a meal. Um, and then the bottom one there, that's, that's from a, a fall armyworm egg mass, really kind of it puts a silky covering on it to kind of protect those eggs. But, uh, but just some examples of what you might see uh, in the case of looking for good and bad bugs, uh, are egg masses. Great, great indicator of what we're dealing with. Um, so true bugs. A lot of times folks will say they saw a bug in their garden. Um, in the entomology world, um, a, a bug to me, I think of a true bug, which is basically you think of a stink bug. Um, so not all insects are bugs, but all bugs are insects. How about that? Um, to throw that one out there. Um, we tend to even make the mistake of calling spiders and centipedes and things like that bugs. It's just a good colloquial term. Um, I know what, what folks in general mean. I, I say it too, uh, call everything a bug or a critter. <laughs> uh, but, but bugs, scientifically speaking, are this family of insect, your true bugs. They're all gonna have sucking mouth parts. Um, things like, again, stink bugs, white flies, aphids, um, all those, those piercing sucking mouth parts uh, are gonna fall under that category. Um, again, even go into like your fleas and things like that. They all fall under that, that, that kind of true bug outline there. Primarily, at least in a garden sense, um, they're gonna be feeding on the fruiting structures. So whether it's the buds of a flowering plant, you know, if it's an ornamental plant or uh, the physical fruit, you know, I've got pictures of there's grapes on here or maybe bean pods. They're, they're piercing those pods to get to the bean inside, the actual fruit that seed that's being produced. That's where all those nutrients, the protein, all that is, that's what they want. Uh, but you can have things like the bottom right corner is a picture of uh, like an azalea lace bug. Uh, we see a lot of that on azalea bushes. People will send pictures like this and wanna know why their leaf looks like this. Why is it not pretty and green? And I usually tell them flip it over and take a picture or flip it over. And what do you see? They're usually, they'll be covered with these little black, uh, maybe even yellowish colored, uh, insects. Some will have wings and some will be immature and just be really tiny without wings. Um, but they're there sucking on the underside of the leaf. So when in doubt, always flip a leaf over if you see something suspicious and see what's underneath that leaf. Um, odds are if there's a pest on there, 
a lot of things will hide out under leaves. It's just kind of a safety thing. They try to camouflage, be out of sight so they don't get eaten uh, kind of deal. Um, so always flip over the leaves and you may find a whole other world under there. But the true bug family I've got on here that they also known to transmit pathogens, probably one of our most prolific um, methods of disease transfer and not necessarily between, you know, insects to humans so much as plant to plant. Um, uh, so, or insect to plant, I guess. Uh, they can transmit a lot of uh, mosaic viruses and uh, and other diseases, um, bacteriums and things like that, uh, that can travel between, with the, the way these insects feed, uh, they release digestive enzymes into a plant and then it dissolves that tissue and then the bug can suck it up. Um, so I know it's lunchtime. I hope I'm not grossing anybody out too much. Bug talks over lunchtime are always fun for me. Um, at least I'm not talking about anything that's going to make anybody itch today. Um, but uh, I've, I've given tick and flea and stuff talks too, and it's always fun to watch the crowd squirm, but I, I won't, hopefully I won't traumatize you too much with that. But um, stink bugs, again, fall in this family. This is the best example of a true bug, uh, at least in the sense that we're talking about today. Again, the egg masses, they, they can very often, they are laid out in like a geometric shape. It's really cool. I wish I could explain to you how the insects know how to make a, uh, you know, a, a hexagon with their egg masses, um, but it's very common to see that kind of stuff. Um, most of their eggs are going to be, they look like tiny little barrels. Uh, if you could, if you took those off or, you know, grab the leaf and put it under a microscope, they're almost perfect little cylinders. And then they'll have a little cap on the top that when those eggs hatch, it literally pops open. Uh, like you use a can opener on it kind of thing. They just pop open and the bugs come out. Uh, and then I've got the arrows kind of pointing to where the different life cycles can go. Um, there's common colors. The nymphs can be lots of different colors, um, but typically... Uh, that the one in the middle there is going to turn into your brown marmorated stink bug, the one we mentioned earlier, and then the one on the right is more of a greenish yellowish color, and a lot of times those will be turning into our uh, our southern green stink bugs like that too. So typically get more calls about the brown stink bugs than the green ones. The green ones, uh, they're a native species out there. They're not uncommon to find in the gardens, but uh, the brown marmoratids are just so much more numerous being invasive and things like that. Um, some examples of famous true bugs. Again, these are all, think of think of stink bugs. They're all in that same family. Kutsu bugs, I don't know how many folks have dealt with that. Um, a lot of times, at least I know in my backyard, uh, I, I've got a, a wooded area behind me that uh, where a neighbor's got his, his house back in there, but the woods back up to my backyard and there's some kutsu, just a little bit, um, that's right there kind of on the forest edge there. Uh, and it's a small enough patch, but it's got plenty of kutsu bugs in it. So at the right time every year, the whole backside of my house can be covered in kutsu bugs. And inevitably they find their way in, no matter how hard I try, they'll, they'll find their way inside the house and things like that. So that's my experience, not so much from a crop standpoint or protecting plants standpoint, as far as damage goes, but they're a nuisance inside my home. Uh, they do smell really bad. They are a stink bug. Um, the, it's not like a super offensive odor, but you get a high number of them and whatever compound that they release, uh, when they get together, it just, it really mess. I don't know if I'm allergic to them or what, but it really, it really flares me up sometimes. So I have to treat these guys pretty seriously, but it doesn't affect everybody that way. But I can always tell if I go out in my backyard, I can tell when the kutsu bugs are out, uh, or when they've shown up because I can, I can smell that, uh, you know, from several hundred feet away where that kutsu patch is, but um, just an example of what their egg masses look like on leaves there. They're a major or a famous pest, I guess I should say, because they they feed on kutsu, which is great, right? Um, but they also feed on soybeans and other bean crops. Um, so an invasive pest uh, that's feeding on another invasive species being kutsu. Um, but the issue there, we wouldn't care if they didn't also feed on our beans especially soybeans. It's a major economic crop there. So Harley Quinn bugs, they're really neat. Um, their egg masses, again, you think of those little barrel shaped eggs, they're black and white striped. They always look like that. So if you see those eggs, um, that's a the black and white eggs. You can scrape those off and that's all you have to do with those egg masses. If you see stuff like that, just, just scratch them off. Uh, Ansel, grab them, carry them away, all that kind of stuff. Um, you, you could spray egg masses to your heart's content, but the odds are you're not going to kill what's ever inside because it's protected by that, that covering, right? That shell. Um, but once they hatch out, they're vulnerable. They're never going to be more vulnerable to if you were using a chemical or, or insecticidal soaps or anything like that, or just the environment in general. 
they will never be more vulnerable than when they are, they're newly hatched. So the younger an insect is, the better you can control it. Um, we've got our leaf footed bugs there as well. And then our squash bugs that we mentioned uh, earlier. And I just, just some adult examples of what you would see. The squash bugs are pretty much always kind of the same color, that kind of ashy gray color, but then the adults are much darker, uh, dark, deep brown to, to blackish color. Um, and, and one adult obviously can lay hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of eggs. Um, so it's always good to kind of keep an eye out on, on your crops and just see, especially if you've got squash, these guys will show up every year. Um, and one of the one of the toughest ones to control, uh, in my opinion there. Uh, some other true bugs, uh, won't really wear this one out, but just other examples, aphids fall under there, leaf hoppers, white flies, mealy bugs, all kinds of good stuff. Cicadas are true bugs as well. That's another great example, have that same piercing sucking mouth part, maybe not considered a pest on, you know, our vegetables or whatnot, or even on our, you know, oak trees or whatever. Uh, but the noise they make uh, can be can be a nuisance, right? So uh, in certain years, but cicadas actually do damage trees. Um, they have a, a basically a saw uh, ovipositor, which is the, the organ on a female insect that that's used to deposit eggs. Uh, it's commonly called a stinger on other insects who like wasps and bees and things. They have ovipositors as well that they, where they lay eggs, but, but uh, they use it as defense as well. Scata doesn't do that, but they can damage young, very young, newly installed saplings and things because they will cut into that bark with that, that saw ovipositor. It's got little jagged teeth on it. It can damage trees that way, but um, for, for that sense, but they fall in that family. Uh, aphids and white flies are probably the most famous outside of your stink bugs, I would think, for true bugs. Um, aphids are everywhere. Again, I mentioned there's about 5,000 different species worldwide of aphids. Some are host specific. A lot of them aren't. Um, there's a uh, hibiscus aphid, which is in that picture on the top. Uh, a lot of them look similar too, right? You can say, I found a green aphid. Well, that could be 2,000 species of aphids uh, or something like that. You know, that could be green in color. So, and they can change color depending on their diet. So if there are more uh, generalized uh, species of aphid, they may actually have a different body, a body color, maybe a darker green or orange or red or something. But there are certain ones that are certain specific colors, bright yellows and things like that. Um, let's see here. They, yeah, they can be all kinds of, uh, uh, they're typically all the, the same kind of pear shape to them, uh, the aphids are anyway. Um, and they're real fleshy. They're real easy to, to, to kill, to control. Um, but the, the typical problem is there's so many of them that they're really hard to control and they spread really quickly. Um, the, the quicker the population builds up, they actually are able to um, fly. There are aphids that have wings and that's, that's uh, they're born with wings and that's how they spread their population. So when it becomes too dense, some chemical action or hormone action within the aphids uh, body, the female aphid um, will produce winged aphids so that they can spread. So there won't be an overpopulation on, on a plant species that they're working on there. Uh, just some more images of, of aphids. One of the neat things um, that I learned about aphids years ago was they don't lay eggs, they give live birth. Um, so that picture in the top middle, um, that's part of the reason why they can reproduce so quickly is that they can just churn out live young. Um, they are also parthenogenic, uh, which basically means that they don't have to mate to give birth. Um, so when they don't mate, they produce females um, and females produce more females. So it, they, they, that's how they get out of hand so fast. Um, the other thing that can make it a little difficult to control as far as when it comes to hoping that maybe, you know, ladybugs love to eat aphids and things like that. A lot of our beneficials will. Um, ants are known to farm aphids. The aphids secrete honeydew, like that one in the top left, the little droplets, it's essentially sugar water. Uh, it's, it's excess um, sugars that it has extracted out of the sap of a plant. And it will put out that little bead like that on its rear end and ants will come by and collect that. Um, and in return, the ants will fight off uh, other beneficials or other predators that may come in and try to attack the aphids. So one of the one of a, the neat little, I guess I always like to compare it to like you know, uh, cattlemen and their cattle kind of thing. The ants are kind of wrangling up. They're not controlling where the aphids go, but they're they're kind of warding off any any hazards, any predators that come through. So another downside of the aphids as well as the white flies too um, is the picture in the bottom right has uh, sooty mold. 
uh, on the plant there. So these, these droplets uh, that these aphids excrete, again, it's just essentially sugar water. So it, it can coat the leaves and the foliage below where there's an infestation. And the leaves, you may have seen that on, on a, even on trees and things, where the leaves might look shiny and you touch them and they're a little sticky. That's because it's essentially sugar, dried sugar water on those leaves. And that sugar will mold and mildew, and then you'll it'll end up looking like that. And so that's a doesn't harm the plant other than it can cover those leaf surfaces and kind of reduce a lot of vigor, uh, kind of cut down on photosynthesis and things like that. Um, these are silver leaf white flies, um, very common in greenhouses and things like that. Really tiny, you can kind of see on that leaf on the bottom there just how small in scale these guys are. Uh, very very tiny, uh, and the the ones you can actually see on the leaf. On the bottom left there, uh, they have wings. That's why they stick out so well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the ones in the top picture there, those are the immatures. They just hatched out of the eggs. They are super, super tiny, almost microscopic. Uh, those are your crawlers, as they call them. They'll crawl around. Uh, they have the same little piercing sucking mouth parts and high populations of, of these little uh, white flies can turn your leaves chlorotic. You'll see, start to see little stippling and uh, little little tiny yellow specks or even white specks that may show up on the top side of the leaf. But like I said before, just flip it over and that's what you'll see. You'll see these little critters crawl around underneath. Um, so if you were gonna treat or spray even neem oil or, or some other even organic mixtures, things like that, you need to flip over that leaf and apply it to where they are. Uh, if you just spray it all over the plant, but if you don't spray underneath, you're gonna miss them. Uh, and, and a lot of those products need to contact in order to have some kind of effect. Um, so always look under the leaf. I can't say it enough there. Um, just some common treatments uh, that are recommended uh, in our pest control guides and things like that. <laughs> I always say the stink bugs, you can just hand pick them and squish them if you're into that. Um, I always love the community gardens. The ladies go out there and they'll, uh, squash bugs especially, they, they, they always say that these things have the best name. It tells you what to do with them when you see them, you squash them. Uh, so they'll take the leaves literally with, the, with squash bugs on them and fold them together and squash the bugs and then wash them off kind of thing. Um, you can use water hoses and things like that to spray off a lot of these, um, but depending on your plant, you don't wanna damage it. So it can take a high pressure uh, coming out of that hose to, to wash off some of these pests. Remember a lot of them are attached. They've got their little mouth parts in there. So they're kind of hanging on. You can spray off a lot of them that way. And typically, you know, whether it's a rose bush or tomato plants or whatever, uh, if you spray them off and they end up on the ground, a lot of times they're not going to make, make their way back up to that, to the rest of where their population is. So those, those will die a lot of times. Um, but, you know, if you have a, a tender tomato plant and you go to town with it with a pressure washer, I mean, you've done way more damage than that aphid ever did to your tomato plant. So it's all kind of relative to your situation and to your problem there. But there are, uh, on the scale of, of pesticide treatments, um, there's very mild, you know, even organic level pesticides um, that have very low to maybe even no toxicity. Maybe it's just like an oil, like an insecticidal soap or a horticulture oil that literally just coats those small aphids uh, and kind of smothers them out. There's not really any chemical that would kill it versus the, the more conventional uh, treatments like permethrins and carbarils. Carbarils, you know, you think of seven is probably the most common uh, product for that. Works great on these things. Works great on stink bugs, aphids, stuff like that. Um, but you always want to be careful. Make sure you follow your, your label. Read the label first. Uh, read. It'll tell you when you're supposed to use it, how you're supposed to use it, how much of it you're supposed to use. Do you use it in rain and shine? You have to water it in. Does it need to stay dry? Is it a powder? Is it a liquid? How much, how much you mix it? Is it pre-mixed? Tells you all that stuff, um, but just follow the label. Uh, if you end up deciding that, well, a little bit worked good. So if I use three times as much, man, I'll never have to worry about this again. Well, now you've just created some kind of hazard and technically broken the law. Um, those those labels on those products are are EPA certified and they've been tested, and that's that's the concentrations that legally those products are held to. So it becomes an issue with the user can be legal, legally liable if they go outside those parameters. So you can always use less than what the label says. Don't use more. <laughs> um, that's That that can in, end up in a, in a bigger problem. You may end up harming the plant that you're trying to treat. You may kill beneficial insects if you don't apply it at the right time, um, all that kind of stuff. But all that information is on pesticide labels as well. So just follow your label. Um, this is a close-up image of the stink bugs. When I talk about uh, beneficials versus, or predators versus a pest, the, the kind of hand-drawn image there on the right is really what I wanted to show. 
Um, the big difference is, and I don't expect people to go start flipping stink bugs over. You can, that'd be great. Um, you'll learn a lot. Um, but, uh, but the mouth parts on those are built differently. So your pest has a much more like finer thread-like narrower, uh, mouth part or a straw or a rostrum. It's technically what it is. Um, whereas the predator, I mean, it's, it's big and bulky. It's got to pierce through the, uh, the outside, you know, the exoskeletons of things of these insects, right? So it's got to be a little beefier than, than what the pest has. The pest just has to, to penetrate soft plant tissue. Um, so that's a big diagnostic thing too. If I really couldn't tell, I could look under a microscope and look at their mouths and say, this is good, this is bad, just off their mouth shapes. So some other beneficial true bugs. Um, again, they're not all bad. Not all stink bugs are evil. These are all considered stink bug-ish insects. They're all in that true bug family. A big eyed bug is one of my favorite. It's a tiny little bug, um, but it's got, it's called that because it's got these big eyes up here in the top right. Um, the small insect, but feeds uh, on immature scale insects and, and white flies, aphids, things like that. Uh, very small. You see it says three millimeters on there. Uh, pirate bug, um, great at, at uh, scale control, things like that. Um, the one on the bottom left is a stink bug nymph. Um, so even when they're immature like that, they are solely predaceous. They are not, um, they're not eating plants. They are hunting, uh, even, as, even as immature stink bugs are predatory ones there. He's got him a caterpillar or whatnot there. Uh, and then the bottom right uh, is one of our largest examples of a predatory stink bug. It's called a wheel bug. And if you can tell there, I'm sure everybody's familiar with what a Japanese beetle is. Maybe you've had to go to bat with those. I'll talk about those a little later. Um, but uh, he's got a Japanese beetle. He has speared that thing uh, off that rose bush and he's sitting on the rose bush. Now these guys are pretty big, uh, you know, inch and a half to, to a couple inches big. And I always tell folks it's, a, it's an awesome looking bug. It's called a wheel bug because it's on its back, kind of on its shoulder blades, if you want to think of it like that. It's got kind of, it looks like a saw blade, a really wicked looking insect, um, but they're big and they've got this big piercing mouth part and they will bite you, bite you, so to speak. They will stab your hand if you hold them. Um, so I haven't had that. I've held a couple of them. Uh, usually I'll try to have gloves on for that, but they can, if they get the itch, they can also, uh, can, can stab you too. So just be wise of that. Um, but, but if you see something that big, they're usually monstrous size compared to other bugs like i said compared to that japanese beetle and so i get calls and pictures like what in the world is this mutant um but that's what it is it's a native insect native predatory stink bug pretty neat uh, moving on to some chewing pests now caterpillars are by far in a garden situation again whether it's flower gardens uh, ornamental stuff trees vegetable gardens whatever um caterpillars are always just going to be uh, a pest in a lot of situations um, majority of them, I should have, I could have started this talk off like that. Majority of our insects, um, it's something like 3% of the insects in the world are categorized as pests. So it's a very small percentage. In, insects, for the most part, have very little impact on our, our day to day uh, movements and things like that. You know, most of the time it's out of sight, out of mind. But there's that small percentage, and there's just enough of them where they can cause a big problem if they go unchecked. So caterpillars are one of the big parts of that. Um, chewing damage is what we're looking for here, just like these pictures show. Uh, there's uh, the one on the top right. That's from a pickle worm. Um, all I see on that, that's a that's a squash. And all I would see on that is literally that hole, that perfectly round hole. And there's a caterpillar. There might be two or three holes. There may be three or four caterpillars inside that. Um, but they they bore in through the surface, and then they will eat the flesh on the inside of that that squash essentially eat it hollow um, and ruin that. Um, then you've got the actual defoliating caterpillars, like the one on the bottom right there. Uh, that is a um, imported cabbage worm. So it is going to town on this brassica plant, uh, uh, collards or whatnot. And I can see a couple of them on there. They're kind of hard to point out, but they're, they're little green velvety looking caterpillars. Uh, and so the first thing you would see is like, oh man, something is, I have nothing but like veins left on my leaves. All the tissue is gone. That's, that's a caterpillar pest. Um, even beetles that also chew beetles don't typically eat that much tissue like that. Your caterpillar, there's a reason why it was called a hungry, hungry caterpillar, right? They can move from plant to plant and fruit to fruit and just go to town. The one in the middle on the bottom there, uh, that is the uh, tomato hornworm, the infamous tomato hornworm. Um, the big, real big green caterpillars that folks have probably dealt with. And then the other image down there that's got that webbing on it, that is the uh, fall webworm. Um, we had a lot of those this past fall. I had a lot of calls from that big, big uh, occurrence of those this, this past year. Just not considered a, a, a real 
pest. It's it's an eyesore. But what they do is they build that cocoon. There's several caterpillars um, inside that webbing. But the only thing they damage, the only thing they do is they eat the leaves off of the limbs that are inside that webbing. So they don't spread all over the tree. They're not going to spread from tree to tree. Um, it's a Some years are real big for them. Last year was a big year for those guys. And then some years are not. Um, if it's a real unsightly thing for that, I usually tell folks just prune it off or worst case, if you can reach it, you can take a, a broom handle or something, uh, some other type of stick or whatnot, and you can tear open that webbing and just, just open it up. And then birds will be your best friend and come in and pick those guys off. So, uh, not, but nothing you have to go and spray. Honestly, if you sprayed that webbing, it wouldn't reach the caterpillars anyway. That's part of the reason that they make those nets, right? For protection. Um, so again, plenty of, there's no shortage of caterpillar pests. This is just a few examples uh, on here. You know, the fall armyworm is another one that uh, when we get those in big numbers, um, they can be a real big problem. They eat all kinds of stuff, um, especially turf grass. Um, there's a lot of research at the experiment station here in Griffin. They do a whole uh, research labs that are dedicated to studying this caterpillar pest. Um, because it is such a turf grass pest. So they can eat grass, they can eat corn. Um, they've been seen on other crops as well, but typically uh, for whatever reason, corn, there's, there's, there's a genetic variety of it. They're the same species, but some of them are predisposed to want to eat corn and some of them are predisposed to want to eat turf grass. Specifically Bermuda grass is their favorite from what I understand. So, um, so if you see your lawn, turning brown or turning yellow and you happen to see these little caterpillars crawling around they're called army worms for a reason they spread like wildfire and they grow really fast um i think last year was a pretty good year for them uh we had several reports of it last year but then the year before i didn't have many at all so it just kind of depends um it, it's a very environmental they don't live in georgia they don't build nests here or lay eggs here or anything like that they literally they blow up with traffic tropical storms um and, and, and jet streams and things, uh, they, they tend to exist down in Southern Florida, uh, Mexico, um, Caribbean area, things like that. And they will blow up on jet streams and, and with even hurricanes and things like that. If you have a big hurricane year, odds are you may see a big number of these guys. Uh, just an interesting, interesting way that they get about. Um, so here's some images, just kind of what you see as a caterpillar and what you might see as a moth. A lot of folks may see a moth and not, not think anything of it, but um, these are just some of these, these dirty brown moths, which looks like most of the moths. They don't tend to be too colorful um, because most of them are nocturnal. So they don't have to be all showy and whatever. They want to be kind of camouflaged. If this guy landed on a tree trunk, he'd probably blend right in, right? So that's a, uh, a, a, an adaptation that they have. Um, but corn airworm on the top feeds on corn um, and uh, loves to eat corn silks, things like that. The one in the middle is the imported cabbage worm. That's a real green, fuzzy, kind of velvety looking caterpillar uh, that attacks all kinds of brassicas. What I usually tell folks is look for, the, look for that butterfly. And that's not a moth, that is a butterfly. It'll be out in the daytime, but it's bright white and it'll have either one or two spots. Um, one spot, uh, I believe one spot is male. And if it has two spots, it's a female. I may be getting those backwards, but um, but it's a bright white butterfly, has those little black tips on the wing. But if you see those little butterflies flittering around in your vegetable garden, especially if you've got cabbages or things or uh, collards or anything like that, and you're like, oh, look at the pretty butterfly. Well, they're not out there necessarily pollinating. Every time that thing swoops down into your plant, it's laying eggs. Uh, and then it'll pop back up and flitter on to the next thing and swoop back down, it's laying more eggs. So if you see the white butterfly, um, go inspect those plants and look for those little egg masses like we showed before. Even, even you might even see some of the little green worms, uh, the little caterpillars. And you can pluck those off. They're easy to pull off. Um, sometimes they hide down. If you think of a cabbage uh, in the middle, they'll hide down kind of in the nooks and crannies of those leaves in the middle. So sometimes you have to kind of peel those back a little bit. But if you start seeing little holes, little, little chew damage marks, look for those caterpillars. Uh, you can really save yourself a lot, of, a lot of headache if you go through and just kind of pick them off. Um, the bigger they get just with any caterpillar and really any insect, but the larger a caterpillar gets, the harder it is going to be to kill when it comes to using some kind of chemical uh, or treatment like that. It's pretty much going to be, you're going to have to hand pick it uh, at that point. And you'll probably have a lot of them too, if they're allowed to get that big. There's probably several more that are also that big. Uh, and the bottom one was a tomato horn, by the way, in case, in case folks didn't see that one there. There are alternative methods of control uh, that we can use for a lot of our uh, caterpillar pests. Um, I, I put the aluminum foil on here. This was for, I had a gardener that swore up and down 
that if we took aluminum foil strips, this was for a, uh, a squash vine borer. If we took aluminum foil and wrapped them around the base of the plant, that we wouldn't have any issues with squash vine borer. Um, I saw, I kind of understand that was, you know, whatever technique they, that had been passed down to them. Um, but it's, it could kind of hold water. Now, I will say we haven't tried this in our community garden to see if it really worked. Um, we usually have, we usually treat about the time that they show up just to avoid them. Um, some of them, we always end up losing some plants to them because you can't get everything. Um, we just try to plant enough squash to where we get some. Uh, but, uh, but those, the squash vine borer will lay eggs at the soil line. So where that base of that plant hits the soil, they will lay an egg right there. So I could see if you put the foil, when that egg hatches, it can't go through the foil and it, and the, the little immature will die. But if they're smart enough and can crawl over the foil, they can still get to your plant. So at least that's, that's how I see it. They're not going to immediately going to die when they touch foil. So if they explore a little bit, they may still get in your plant. But just, just all kinds of little tips and tricks that people have told me over the years of, of what works. And she swore up and down that this was going to work. So I told her if it worked for her, that's great. Uh, but uh, we had we hadn't tried it yet, but uh, but it, it was a neat neat idea. Um, the floating row covers are a fantastic way to keep a lot of pests off, not just caterpillars and moths and things, um, but your stink bugs and, and whatnot. The only downside of that is you got to make sure you go back and open it up, right? Especially if you're if you're having any kind of crop that you're growing in a, in a vegetable garden, it needs to be pollinated. Um, so if we keep it closed off all year long, great. My plants are happy and healthy. Only downside is I don't have any fruit because the bees and the wasps and the butterflies, everything else couldn't get to it. So you kind of have to watch for when you're blooming. Uh, at least by then, a lot of plants, by the time they're flowering and things, they're hardy enough a lot of times that they can sustain some attacks by pests. Um, so you at least get more than, than maybe you would have had you not done anything, I guess. Uh, but row covers are, are a great technique, especially early on uh, when the plants are still small and growing. Uh, pheromone traps are another thing as well. They only catch males, uh, male insects, whether they're flies or moths or whatever. Typically in this case, uh, this trap was being used for moths, uh, but it only catches the male. So it's it's not gonna control, it's not gonna eradicate your moth problem if you have them out there laying eggs and, and creating a bunch of caterpillar problems. But it's it's a great tool in the sense of, we can, we can put a pheromone trap out there and if we go back and look at it and we have insects that are trapped on, if we have that, that species, that pest trapped on it, we know they're there. And then we can go and move on to the next step of control. But a trap by itself isn't going to control it. Um, so some common treatments for caterpillar pests. Um, and really, this would work for, for chewing pests in general, a lot of this. There are all kinds of uh, uh, pyrethrins, um, the bifenthrins, the carbrils, so your sevens, um, spinosids. There's some of those that are labeled organic. Um, a, a big organic product would be the Bacillus thuringiensis, or it's commonly called BT. Uh, that is, there There are some out there now as well that will also control beetle grubs and beetle pests and things like that. Um, but typically they were developed for uh, caterpillar pests. Um, and so they, they're, the different formulations of the different species, it's a naturally occurring uh, uh, product, basically it exists in, in native soils and things like that. But it's been basically essentially, I guess, kind of, uh, harvested or, or, or made in a way to where it's caterpillar specific. So what that means though, is that it could also, if you have, you wouldn't want to put this on like a pollinator plant. Um, if you're trying to control, you know, some, you know, Japanese beetles or something, because if you've got caterpillars that are going to feed on that, even if they're, you know, monarchs or whatever the case, uh, you wouldn't want to put this on milkweed anyway. There's nothing on that's going to eat milkweed, whatever, as opposed to monarchs, that's all they eat, right? So point being, you want to keep it away from your beneficial plants, your, your good plants, your pollinator plants, because lots of those pollinators are caterpillars at some point, um, and you may end up harming that population. So put it where you want it, put it on the right plant. Don't just broadcast it to everything. Put it where you're having problems or, you know, put it on your tomato plant, that's fine. Uh, you won't have any issue. You'll, you'll, con you'll control your hornworms and, and uh, earworms and other stuff like that that may give you a problem. But again, read the label on that stuff too. Everything will tell you how to do it. Um, some other other insects we've got here, a little less common as far as what people report to me that they 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 may say they found this, but it's not really a problem. Um, but a category is called leaf miners. Now this is made up from could be a lot of them are fly uh, flies and wasps are going to be most of the leaf miner species. Um, and this is what it looks like. So if you see a leaf, 
that's got this kind of crazy zigzag pattern. Maybe it's got a little tunnel. Maybe you can even see like that top image. Maybe you can even see a little a little worm or a little caterpillar in there. Um, that's a lot of these are beneficial. Um, so I usually tell folks you don't have to worry about it. Um, it typically doesn't occur in such a large number that it would become a problem, that it's gonna kill your plant. Most plants will survive this. It may not look like that one on the bottom left, looks like it's really kind of eaten up. That's only probably two or three little caterpillars that have done that. Um, they, they can cover a whole leaf surface like that. If it's that big of an eyesore, if it's on an ornamental thing, there, there are plenty of species that will do this on oak trees or rose bushes or something along that line too. Just pluck the leaf off you'll be, and you'll be fine. Uh, you don't have to spray anything. Obviously, again, if you sprayed that leaf with a chemical, it's in between the leaf surfaces. That's where that, that insect is feeding. It's eating out all that green chlorophyll and it goes between the cells and all that, the different veins and things. So you could spray stuff, a chemical on the leaf surface, but it's not gonna treat that anyway. But they don't usually occur in such a high population that you need to worry about. It's really more of an aesthetic issue. So, but if you saw that on a squash plant, um, I've seen it on poison ivy, honestly. Uh, there's a species of wasp that specifically feeds on poison ivy leaves like that. I've seen those patterns, pretty neat. Um, but don't worry about it. Don't, you can just pluck those leaves off if it's something that's an eyesore uh, and your plant will regrow leaves and things like that. But it's not gonna spread through the whole plant, get in the stem and kill it. And it's, it doesn't do anything like that. So beetles are really gonna be one of the last categories I'll talk about here. This is the largest order of insects. Um, so by far, um, I believe it's, it's nearly half of all the insects in the world are, they belong to the beetle order of insects. So naturally you're gonna have probably your most numerous pests that you're gonna have are gonna be beetles whether or not you realize it. They damage by chewing. Got a lot of good examples on here. Um, those are flea beetles in those top two images there on the left in the middle. Uh, the one on the right is a Colorado potato beetle. I haven't seen a whole lot of those here. We used to have a ton of them back uh, in Tennessee when I was doing some research there. Um, they don't just eat potatoes, but uh, and they're not just living in Colorado, uh, as we learned in Tennessee. They were they were quite numerous up there too. So, but that's where they were described and named and things. So that's how they got their name. But they're essentially you can think of them like a big ladybug, um, but they feed on our crops. Then of course our favorite Japanese beetles down there on the bottom. Um, always love images like this because every time I see a picture at any given time, you'll find with this kind of a a glob of Japanese beetles, at least half those guys, they're actively mating while they're also defoliating whenever they're eating. So very, very difficult uh, pest to try to neutralize. Um, they just reproduce so prolifically. They always come out in huge numbers. Um, if you have a big problem with them year after year after year, what I usually tell folks is when it comes to Japanese beetles is that you're gonna want to treat the soil. <laughs> Because when they're immature, when they're before they turn into adults, turn into before they turn into that beetle we all know and love, uh, and come out and fly around and buzz our heads and eat our rose bushes and everything else in our garden, uh, they are grubs in the ground. Um, and the younger you can catch them, just like any other insect, the younger you can uh, have some kind of activity, a chemical activity on those grubs, the better control you're going to have. And it may take a couple of years of kind of battling that. Same thing with if you have armadillos out there digging up your yard. Uh, digging divots in the ground, they're they're looking for these guys. They're out there digging for grubs. These things are very high in protein, very nutritious. Armadillo's favorite thing on the menu uh, are beetle grubs. So there's also June beetles and uh, chafer beetles and some other species too. Uh, but the Japanese beetle by far is the winner when it comes to something that is going to be a grub that's going to come out of the ground and just wreck your life. Um, whether again, whether it's rose bushes or maple trees or tomato plants or your, your pole beans or whatever, I, they eat everything. Um, so I've got a lot of information on here that I'm, I'm for the sake of time, I'm not gonna read through every bit of it, um, but uh, uh, fairly difficult to control is really the biggest takeaway from that. You typically have to treat the soil. Um, there is a product, I guess I'll go back. There's a product called Milky Spore uh, that I mentioned at the bottom there. I've had about 50-50 success on using that kind of product. Uh, it's a natural, fungus that lives that's just native it exists in soils um so adding more of it may or may not help i don't know um but there's been results that have said yay it helped and then you do the same thing the following season and uh, it made no difference so it, it may have control one year and then may not the next but um a lot of times with those japanese beetles i usually take a bucket of soapy water 
and kind of hold it underneath them and then just tap the plant. And they just instinctively, they let go of whatever they're doing and they'll fall in that bucket. And that's how I catch a lot of them. But very, very hard pest to control. I will say you do not want to put the beetle traps up. Don't put your Japanese beetle trap that you can buy at a box store. They work really well. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a false advertisement, but they will lure every Japanese beetle that you may never have had. Uh, those pheromones are so strong. It will pull in outside beetles that you may have never seen. Um, and so you'll catch all the beetles in the neighborhood. Um, so I always joke with folks, I'm like, maybe talk your neighbor into getting one. But don't do that, though, because they can still come to your property. So uh, but don't, don't waste your money on the on the beetle traps. Again, they work really well, but they fill up really fast. And then once that trap is full, uh, you'd have to go get another one to catch even more. Um, but uh, you're just going to attract way too many beetles to deal with. So it's easier just to, to treat the ones that you've got. Flea beetles. Uh, I'll touch on this one quickly. This one you may notice or recognize some of that damage in that top left picture. I see a lot of this on a lot of, uh, uh, you know, eggplants for six, specifically eggplant and pepper plants. I've noticed this a lot. Um, they like sweet potatoes, uh, like potatoes as well. But when you see the leaves, uh, they have these little tiny holes, almost like somebody took a shotgun blast to it. Um, those are flea beetles. They feed like that. They eat those little tiny divots. Um, on the top and bottoms, they can be on either side, but they'll eat the surface of the leaf, but they usually just eat those tiny little holes. And each time they feed, they'll make a new little hole. Um, and you can end up with population of them too and, and see that kind of shotgun effect, that shot hole effect on those leaves. When they're immature, they're actually, they're called a wire worm, um, but they're, they're grubs just like the other beetles, uh, like the Japanese beetles and things, but they're, they're longer, elongated. Um, and they call those wireworms and they'll feed on the tubers. So on potatoes, they can be a, a nuisance underground, but you may not know that you've got a problem uh, until you dig up the potatoes. So uh, you, a good way to see it is if you notice a lot of these little beetles hopping around on your plants, they're called flea beetles because they do fold their rear legs up like that and they tend to hop more than fly from plant to plant and leaf to leaf. Um, but uh, if you see a lot of those uh, insects on the top part on your leaf, on your potato plants and things, uh, or on your eggplants and things like that, or you see those shot hole patterns, then you know you've probably got an issue underground as well if you've got tomato. Obviously, if you've got eggplants and peppers and things, you're not worried about the tubers underground. Um, but if you see a lot of them on, on potatoes, you may have to may want to treat uh, in the future for the flea beetles as well to kind of protect your harvest. Colorado potato beetle, again, it feeds on potatoes uh, as well as other crops. Um, it likes several, several different plants, um, but it, it was just, identified and first seen, I guess, on a potato plant. Uh, it actually eats a lot of weed plants too. So one of the recommendations is to keep, uh, which you'd wanna keep garden weeds out anyway, right? Um, but it eats a lot of things, uh, goodness, uh, like the ground cherries and, and things like that. It likes to feed on that kind of stuff, um, the, the solanaceous kind of plants. Um, but it can also feed on, I've rarely have I seen it on tomatoes, but I've seen it do it. Uh, it's usually on, on those either wheat species or on the potato leaves. I've seen it on beans as well sometimes, um, but I don't know if it wanted to go there or if I just happened to find it there. If it just landed there and I just happened to be the lucky guy that found it. But um, it's a big, pretty big. It's, it looks like a ladybug, but kind of on steroids. It's a little bit, little bit longer, about a half inch long. Uh, so maybe twice the size of what a normal ladybug would look like. And they always look like this. They've always got that striped pattern. Uh, their egg mass is there on the right, the little yellow eggs. Uh, and then their immatures are in the middle there, what the nymphs look like. I usually see the adults. I haven't noticed a huge problem with these guys, um, but they're very easy to control. Usually you can treat the, the immature larvas if you see them. Uh, cucumber beetles, I do notice these guys uh, more and more. Um, just like their name implies, they love to eat cucurbits. Um, not so much the fruits as much as they do the leaves. So you start to see that same kind of whole shot pattern, uh, like you can kind of make out there on the right. A lot of these little tiny holes. Maybe you don't see that many beetles on there, um, but uh, but by far, if you see it, it's it's a pretty distinctive beetle. They they can come with spots or they can come with stripes, and you'll never guess what they're called, right? So the spotted ones are called spotted cucumber beetles, and the striped ones are called striped cucumber beetles. Yeah, real 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 difficult, uh, very scientific there. Um, but uh, but they love to feed on your cucurbits. So I see them a lot on our cucumber uh, crops uh, and cantaloupe. Honestly, those are probably the two most. Um, they haven't really done so much, at least, and I, and I 
I'm using the example of our community gardens, our, our three spaces we have here in Griffin that I've, I've seen them on those plants, but they haven't done enough to where we felt like we had to try to eradicate them. Um, so, but it's something to watch. You would want to make sure that you didn't have an explosion of it. So usually you see if you see a couple of them, not a big deal. You go out and you look at a leaf and you see that many on a leaf, like on that picture. Oh man, I need to do something because it's getting out of hand. Um, so just, just kind of realizing that there's a little give and take there kind of find your tolerance of, of how much damage um, that, that you're willing to tolerate, I guess, before you act on them there. On to our beneficials here, lastly, uh, I'll kind of run through this a little quick. Um, ground beetles, there's lots and lots of these guys. You may see them. Usually if you see them, you don't see them very long because the ground beetles, this is pictures of, of tiger beetles here. They're really fast, lightning quick. Uh, they scurry across the ground, kind of on a blur. Um, the really neat thing is they're very distinctive in the sense that they almost always come in these metallic colors, um, whether it's like the one on the bottom right where it's like an emerald green and copper color. Uh, most of the ones that I've seen have either been that bright green or they'll be this tealish metallic color. But you can look at the mouth parts, going back to the mouth parts, right? It's chewing, it has a chewing mouth part. But look at the, the mouth on that thing. So if I saw that and had no idea what it was, it's got big kind of binocular eyes almost like a spider, right? So it can see very well. Uh, and it's got these huge sharp pinchers on it um, made for catching prey, like in that image there where it's caught a, a caterpillar and dragging it back to its burrow. They're solitary beetles. I've seen several of them. They'll fight each other even, they're territorial. Um, not, not a problem to where they're gonna come up and bite you, anything like that. They're scurrying around so fast and hunting, but a great thing if you find those in your garden area, great bug to have, they, they will clean it up quickly. Uh, and uh, you, it just depends on what, what colorations you might find on those. Surfid flies, these are the hover flies that people see. They, a lot of people see them and think they're a bee or a wasp uh, or even a yellow jacket and say, oh man, you know, watch out, it's kind of hovering around. But these are a lot more slender uh, typically than, uh, than, than, a, than a bee or a wasp will be, usually smaller. Um, again, most of them are colorations you'll see in like yellow black colors. They're called hover flies is their common name. And that's an immature, that's its Kind of caterpillar form or larva form on the bottom right there so it looks like a weirdo uh may, may look like a pest um but it actually has a mouth part where it will it will eat it's got an aphid in its mouth right there so it is predatory um in its immature form in its larva form like that and then when it becomes adult uh it's more of a pollinator um but it it it's a parasitic uh fly essentially so it will go around and lay eggs I've got pictures here of a, that's an army worm on the bottom left. And then my buddy there, the Japanese beetle in the middle, uh, those little white oval shapes on both of those critters, those are eggs that, that a fly like that one on the right has laid on that insect. Those eggs will hatch, the, the larva will bore into those insects and kill them. Um, so a fantastic thing. So I know everybody typical uh, thought is flies are gross. You know, what purpose do they serve? A lot of them are pollinators, first of all, like these guys. Uh, and then second of all, there's a lot of them that are parasites, um, not, not to you and me, but to insect pests um, along that line there. So, so great things to have in the garden, um, great beneficial control. Now, will we ever have enough of them to where we'll wipe out the Japanese beetle population? No, uh, they, they don't reproduce that rapidly, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but they're, they're a tool that, that can kind of help us get control. Um, if, we, if we're able to knock back a population and then we just want to be mindful that we're not harming our beneficials uh, when we're out there as well. So that's why it's always important to pay attention to where you're applying stuff. Uh, wasps, hands down, one of the best uh, predatory species we've got. Uh, they're related to ants, so you can kind of think of it that way too. Um, ants are great, uh, great predators as well. Um, typically live in, in nests, so they're a social insect. Um, so there's usually, you know, where there's one, there's usually more, not always, but, but can be. Um, great pollinators as well. The one in the bottom there, it's actually not a predatory wasp. Uh, that's the blue wing wasp, um, but it is, it feeds strictly on nectar and pollen. Um, so yes, it's a wasp um, and it technically has a stinger, but it's a very docile. Uh, most wasps are actually very, very tame with the exclusion of yellow jackets, right? They're an example of a very territorial uh, species of wasp. But again, yellow jackets are beneficial in that sense. They are fantastic hunters. They will go out and catch all kinds of caterpillars uh, and other, other uh, immature insect pests, bring it back to the nest. 
Uh, the problem is they don't like it when we come around either. So, uh, so you got to be mindful of that. But, but just just because we see something as a stinging insect, it might be a nuisance to us. We just need to be mindful of maybe how we can avoid crossing paths with something like that. So having a paper wasp nest outside outside your front door isn't a great thing, but maybe we can encourage that 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 habit that nest building. Uh, habit to occur somewhere else on the property because we still want the benefits of the 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 hunting aspect the predatory and the pollinating benefits of having that wasp nest but maybe we just don't want it outside our front stoop so uh so there, there's all kinds of tips and tricks on on how to encourage uh the different species and things like that parasitic wasps uh one of our, my last category of wasps here just like the flies um you can see they're using their stingers in these different pictures there's one all kinds of shapes and sizes right so we've got the one in the top right He's the size of an aphid. That's how tiny that adult wasp is. But using its little stinger, it's laying an egg inside that aphid. And after a couple of weeks, that aphid uh, will die and a little wasp will hatch out uh, outside of the aphid. The aphid becomes its little cocoon, so to speak. Um, another wasp down there in the bottom doing the same thing with the caterpillar, kind of stinging that caterpillar, laying an egg inside. Uh, and then that egg will, will feed on that caterpillar pest and hatch into a new wasp. And then one of my favorite uh, instances there is the tomato hornworm again, our, our, one of our favorite bugs we love to hate. Uh, and it's covered in lots of cocoons. So this is a, a egg or multiple eggs that were laid inside this caterpillar. And then those wasps are actively parasitizing it and they've spun little cocoons and those little cocoons will hatch and create more wasps off of that. So if you see something crazy like that in your garden, man, I get a picture and, and, and send it to me. I love seeing stuff like that. It's such a neat, neat thing. Uh, that occurs in nature like that. Um, other predators, you can kind of figure a lot of these out, you know, outside of the, the centipedes and spiders and things like that that help us. Um, praying mantises, I, I threw them in here mostly because I'll get pictures occasionally of somebody will find this weird looking thing on a grass stem, or I think well, one of these images was off of a uh, like a pompous grass stem uh, where it shot the had the shoot up there and they had this and trying to figure out if it was something something bad and nope that's what a that's what an egg sack for a praying mantis looks like uh, and there's hundreds and hundreds of eggs you can see them hatching out here um, but praying mantises will as soon as they hatch they will immediately try to attack each other so one of those kind of go back to that clue of if it's a if it's a predatory bug they don't hang around in clusters because they will fight each other um, but but just so folks kind of are familiar with uh, what the egg sacs look like there Lace wings are fantastic. I call these guys, they, they are voracious aphid eaters uh, and in scale insect eaters. Um, but the, the picture in the middle there, he looks like a little alligator to me. Um, fantastic predators, just like ladybug larvae are. Um, they look like something off of an alien planet, look like a little predator insect, you know, out of the movie Predator or whatever. Um, but they they scurry around and they are, they, they have a humongous appetite basically uh, for aphids. So a great bug to see if you see their eggs look like that on that top there on the top right. They lay their eggs on the ends of stalks. Uh, they put these little little silicone threads, uh, little waxy threads that they put out and they lay an egg on the top of it. And that is honestly, it's there to keep it from getting predated. Um, and a lot of times it's there to keep it from when they hatch from eat, from it eating the other eggs around it as well. So it's an interesting adaptation. But if you see something like that on a leaf, it's not a disease. It's not some weird fungus or anything like that. Those are lacewing eggs. Pretty, pretty neat. And spiders and mites. Um, we're pretty familiar with those. Um, my wife hates spiders, so she's happy as long as they're outside and she never has to see them. But I, I, am, I am that person who will grab a spider, pick it up, and take it outside, and I'll go put it in the garden. Um, I'm not a great identifier of spiders, but usually I like to think that you can match the colors a lot. This one, uh, the one I've got a picture here I took off of a katsu patch. Um, it's called a green link spider, and that's where it loves to live. It loves to live in kutsu, and it loves to eat kutsu bugs. So I am happy with that. I see plenty of those guys in my backyard. And then you have mites. There are just as many good mites as there are bad ones. Uh, it's not one I really talked about here, but uh, mites are can be easy to control, but they can also be easy to kind of over control, where you can uh, you can kill the beneficial ones as well, and then you can have big pest population explosions out of that. So it's one of those. Uh, the good and bad mite control um, is kind of a, a delicate balance there because it doesn't take, you know, soapy water could, could kill a lot of mites, honestly. Um, but overall, with our beneficial bugs, the big takeaway we want from today is that we want to use our pesticides sparingly, really only when we deem it necessary. And that's not saying that using a harsh chemical is terrible or you're a horrible person for going to the store. 
and buying a can of raid or anything like that. Um, it's all situational, right? The, the difference is how we use it. Okay. So we don't just need to go empty the can on, on a wasp nest or something, or we don't need to go, uh, you know, use empty an entire bottle of a product uh, on this, on this one plant kind of thing. We need to follow the label. Like I mentioned before, uh, make sure we're using it on the right place. Most of those labels will tell you where you're allowed to apply it as well. So if it's something that's labeled to be used on roses, um, don't go use it on your tomato plants unless it also says it can be used on tomato plants. Uh, most of those products will have lists of insects that it will control, uh, whether it's caterpillar pests or stink bug pests or flies or whatever. Um, it'll usually detail what, what the products can be used for. I always encourage folks to use the least toxic means possible. So it doesn't mean you have to go straight for an organic product or it doesn't mean you have to go straight to hand picking them off the leaves, whatever. If you've got a big population of aphids or beetles or whatever, maybe you need that harsh chemical in the very beginning, one good treatment to knock those populations back so that your beneficials can come back and help maintain that control. But maybe it got so far out of hand that you need to, you need to take some kind of action uh, because doing nothing wasn't gonna work. Um, so, so just, and, and again, it can vary. That's, that's what we're here for, Brooklyn and myself. We're, we're here for that kind of advice on maybe how, how harsh we need to be. Maybe we don't need to treat it all like some of the other pests I mentioned. Maybe we just need to clip something off and problem solve. Um, or maybe that, you know, the whole ounce of prevent, prevention pound of cure saying, you know, maybe there's something we can do preventatively to where we can minimize the pest in the next season. So it could just be something as simple as planting crops at a different time. Um, could be planting beneficial plants. Uh, maybe we plant some more pollinator species of plants to bring in some wasps and bees and things like that that would love to hunt uh, these pests that we're seeing. So all kinds of different methods uh, and, and, and kind of cultural changes we can make to encourage our good bugs instead of our bad bugs. So, but I always encourage folks to kind of take notes no matter what you do, kind of keep a little logbook or, or a mental checklist at least of what you've done differently. Did you buy a new kind of product? Uh, if you did and you used it, how much did you use? How often did you use it? Did it work at those different amounts and times and things like that? Um, did you notice anything that looked like a good bug? Did you see any beneficials out there? Uh, did you see pollinator activity and stuff like that? Those are all important things to keep in mind. Maybe there's some other tactics that somebody gave you, maybe a new idea, a uh, new technique. Maybe you decided to try some physical barriers instead of chemical stuff. Well, I sprayed last year, but I'd really like to avoid that. Maybe I want to put out some floating row covers and put up a physical barrier where maybe that'll cut down on some of my pest problems. So, uh, but just in general, just wanted to thank everybody for, for tuning in. Uh, this here is a, and in case anybody hasn't seen one, that's an immature ladybug. I do get a lot of pictures and calls about, about these guys. Um, they'll see it and they think it's something horrible. I've got some kind of mutant bug again on here, but that's what a ladybug looks like. And that's when it's, you can see it's got an aphid in its mouth. That's when they work. They do the most work when they're immature like that. Again, they look like those little kind of alligator shapes uh, before they turn into their pretty little red, yellow, black counterparts like that. Um, but with that, uh, Brooklyn, I'm, I'm pretty much done. Uh, if anybody's got any questions or anything, I'll be happy to, to, to take whatever I can. Thank you so much, Philip. I know this is a topic that we could go on and on, and yes. that's why they're entire <laughs> degrees <laughs> devoted to entomology. So we're just trying to take a small piece of it today. So we really appreciate your time.